No way, we're saved by hope. We have to have hope. And now by the faith, hope, and charity, and the greatest of these is charity. But they're all somehow related. You know, faith is the substance of things hoped for. For there's a, there's a relationship between hope and faith. And then faith works by love, by charity. But ultimately, it's, it's charity. Have fervent charity among yourselves. Charity and love will cover the multitude of sins or tra- whatever we're going through. But if we have faith, unto every one of us is granted a measure of faith. We are saved uh, not by works, not of ourselves, but we're saved by grace and through faith. We're saved by grace through faith and that faith is not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. God deals you a measure of faith. Now, our, our, our responsibility is to work the faith, d- step out and reach out to God and seek God and then He will respond in order for faith to work and grow and mature, there's an onus on us to work our faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, and that's the importance of hearing the Word of God and being exposed to preaching and, the, and that's, that sort of thing, the speaking of the Word of God. It is the gift of God. And our faith is going to be tested. It's going to be tried. So we encounter things, uh, there's different ways our faith is tried, through physical circumstances, through persecution, through bereavement, and anything like that, that has an intensity to it. It has an intensity to it. And the trials of faith uh, are things that can be difficult, difficult to bear. When I preach a lot on bitterness, uh, and, and I'm defining the word bitterness, uh, bitter experiences are experiences that are are disagreeable, things that we did not want to happen. Uh, they can be difficult to admit or accept or bear them. However, we have, we have help. The Lord is our helper. Yeah. And I talk a lot about Jesus Christ and the attributes of the, the high priest. Jesus Christ is a faithful and merciful high priest over the house of God and... and as a high priest, in the book of Hebrews, it says he's holy, he is harmless, he's separated from sinners so that he has utmost purity. And when Jesus ascended to heaven, you know, he said, I will send you another comforter. And we lean on and, and remember, and try to call to remembrance the promises of God. One of the promises of God is... I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That is the personal visitation of the Holy Ghost to bring comfort to those who need comfort. And those who need comfort are those who are in affliction. Your affliction doesn't have to be uh, you got in a, I don't know, that you're fighting on the front lines in a war, or what, what, what is your affliction? Like I say, it could be a lot of things. It could be a bitter, any kind of bitter experience. It could be persecution, it could be bereavement, it could be uh, financial problems, it could, whatever it is. It could be a betrayal. It could be a lot of things. But whatever it is, we, we can't, uh, the Bible does exhort us don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened. And the other thing to remember is that we are all part of a common salvation. We're part of a common salvation. There's no temptation taken you, but such as is common, common to all men. Every one of us have some kind of burden to bear, some kind of uh, something to endure. And patience becomes critical in all this. Jesus said, in your patience, in your ability to endure through pain, anguish, suffering, travail, burden, your ability to endure through that, in your patience, you will possess your soul. Your soul will be kept through it all. 
God, you are kept by the power of God unto salvation, no matter what you're going through. And I know the temptation is nobody knows what I'm going through. And to a certain extent, from individual to individual, I might say to Carl, well, Carl, you don't know how much bitterness I've been through with my father. And then Carl will say, yeah, well, you don't know how much bitterness I've been through with my brother. Or, you know, so there might be certain points where we may not believe that the we know exactly what the other one endures. For instance, for me, I do not personally, and I'm not able to personally relate to the degree of bereavement that I know some people here have had. Because I have not been, I have not experienced a, uh, a bereavement like that. But there are other trials of faith that I have gone through which have brought pain, anguish, sorrow, temptation to become embittered or, or whatever you want to say. So in that sense, it's common, okay? But I'm not going to pretend to relate to an experience that someone had that I have not had. So I, I can't relate. I can be sympathetic. I can offer condolences. And I can be sincere about that. But there is one who does know. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. He was tempted at all points, yet without sin. And he uh, experienced every kind of temptation there is to experience. And he can relate to every single solitary thing any one of us could ever go through. Or hope, hope not to go through. Or, <laughs> but the thing is, is uh, we always talk about walking with Jesus and taking up the cross and the idea of, of suffering. And pain and agony and all of those things. Well, can Jesus can relate, relate to that? He was a man uh, acquainted with grief. A man of Sorry. sorrows. You think he doesn't know sorrow? He, you know, Jesus knows the loss of many that he ministered to. He knows the loss of... Uh, he, he just knows. He knows. And the thing about that is that there's always, in the absence of finding an individual, that it's hard to be convinced of, you know, often it's hard for me or you to be convinced that a particular individual, they don't understand exactly what I've gone through. There's always, you can always defer back to Jesus, the high priest, who does understand. And so you, we, we find strength from the promises of God. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And I like putting those two together because not only does it mean that you have a promise that he won't leave you comfortless, but that comfort it comes in the form of a personal visitation or a personal administration to you in, in your circumstance and I've, I've gone through that I've gone through trials of faith times I felt very rejected all alone no one understands or whatever and I would get personal visitations from the Holy Ghost Job said thy visitation has preserved me or preserved my spirit so and the other thing is, uh, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So there is, there is also, well, there is a degree to which we can help each other bear one another's burdens. We can bear one another's burdens. There also may be a degree where certain individuals can't wholly relate to your particular burden, but somewhere in the body of Christ... And then finally, ultimately, somewhere in the mind of God and the comfort of the Holy Ghost, uh, there is comfort and consolation in the darkest hour. And first of all, we have to believe it and then uh, so that we can receive it. But yes, there is trial. But if there's anybody who can relate to pain and everything and suffering on, in the inward man, it's, uh, it's Jesus. Um, uh, I think I'll read Isaiah. 53, I guess. Yeah. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And God's arm brought forth salvation. You know, the arm reaching out to help. That represents Jesus Christ, God sending His Son. He shall grow up before Him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. I mean, there's nothing particularly outstanding outwardly that would attract you to him. No form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. 
He is despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we, see, and we esteemed him not. And this is what we don't want to do. We don't want to be overwhelmed or overcome with grief to the extent where we would hide our faces from him. Yeah, and and that, that's a tendency. And I'm not belittling grief in any way, so I'm not. I'm very, very sympathetic to people who are wounding and hurt and grieving. Uh, when we talked about grief, David, David, King David in the psalm somewhere, he, he was so grieved at one point, and I don't remember where it is. It's not, yeah, he said, I am so... Yeah, he said, I cannot even speak. He's so full of grief. But there's another one I'm trying to think of, and I may think of it yet before I, I finish here. Um, well, let's read Psalm 77. One of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the promises of God is all things work together for good. And so you say, how, how can all this uh, trauma or grief or bitterness or bereavement, how does it work towards good? And it's good to, to talk about and actually define it to give that statement some credibility instead of just saying all things work together for good but not knowing how. The last time I preached on this scripture, I, said, I emphasized the we know. Because the Bible doesn't just say all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. It says, for we know that. We know that. We, we understand the reasons why. It's not just some, well... It says it works for good, and I hope it does. No, we actually understand why. Because the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. You know, if you look at the attributes of uh, the characteristics of man and his emotions and his inward man, we know that uh, pride and arrogance, God hates pride, but God is nigh to such as are of a broken and a contrite spirit. And the Bible says, blessed are the meek. And the Bible says, seek meekness. You know, seek meekness. He has shown thee, O, o man, what is good and what the Lord doth require of thee. But to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. So the whole, uh, our whole character, uh, character towards God is we are to pursue, deliberately pursue, humility, humbleness, meekness, brokenness, contrition. Now, I've done some things in my life where I... I lost confidence whether God, at times I lost confidence whether God would ever accept me. Uh, wow, what I did there, uh, I said such nasty things against God in my bitterness. I don't know, uh, he might just be, strike me dead tomorrow. But somehow circumstances would come that would break me. Instead of embitter me, it, it got so intense that I would break. And then I could feel my heart break into a million pieces and then I would begin to cry. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And in that moment, I've ex I experienced the very thing I'm talking about, the visitation of the Holy Ghost to bring comfort. And this presence of the Lord was so overwhelming, I knew, I knew in that moment, I had a clear witness from the Spirit of God, that God did not despise me, in spite of what I did. Because the witness of God, the presence of God, was overwhelming. Because... It brought me to a point of brokenness. Brokenness. A broken and a contrite spirit God will not despise. And the other thing is to keep ourselves fearing God, acknowledging God, and fearing Him. Not just simply afraid of Him, but really that may be a, a part of it. Like I, I'm afraid of what God could do to me. He can cast me into hell if he, he wants. Now, I don't hope that he will, and I don't believe he is. I'm hoping that he will not. And I've gotten enough witness, let's say, in my experience with God, that gradually I've become more and more confident that's not what he's doing. But he could. You know, even Paul said, I can preach to others and not live right, and I myself can be cast away. Now, Paul knew that. He carried that in his conscience and he was afraid of it. Now, he didn't believe that's what was happening to him. And in fact, that's not what happened to him. Right. But it was part of the fear of God. But, it's, but also, it has to do with reverence, fearing God, and knowing that part of the fear of God is, is uh, being aware, conscious, that God wants to supply us certain things from His provision. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Okay, now I can get consolation from a beer bottle. I can get consolation from smoking a joint. 
I can get consolation by going and watching a good movie. I can get consolation from a lot of things and comfort. It won't last very long. And it's not what God wants, but God wants to give me the comfort. You know, you want your source of provision to come according to how God has provisioned it for you. And by and large, we want to receive what we receive according through Jesus Christ according to His riches and glory. Right? So, there is consolation. There is comfort. There is strength. There is something good that's going to come out of it. And I'm not just, I don't want you just to hear me say it and somehow believe it without understanding how it's going to happen. God is going to use the brokenness to cultivate your heart to reach out to Him more. You'll be more open because you have a greater need. And your need will make the heart open more. And you're going to have more richness, more fullness with the people of God and with the Spirit of God, with Jesus Christ Himself. Remember, there's a whole aspect of a relationship with Jesus Christ that He wants you to know that He is concerned about you and your status and your condition personally. He said, I called you by name. By name. He said, all the hairs of your head, they're all numbered. That's how particular and in detail I have planned your life and measured it out. That's how concerned I am with every detail in your life. You know how he said it. Uh, If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the other oven, how much more shall he clothe you? You know. And 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 so if God takes such care and such detail for some, all of these um, elements of creation that don't have a soul, the grass of the field. Now, how much more does He care about us and everything that we go through? And there's times we have to know that. We have to be reminded about that. So our hearts will open to the comfort, open to the consolation. We can receive strength from God to go through it. And it will, God will use it together for good because it will cause us to come together, bear one another's burdens, express and communicate faith and charity back and forth. And it'll also, like I say, cultivate your, it'll open your heart to receive a personal administration from the Holy Ghost. And that's how it works together for good. God is always um, designing or influencing circumstances and he's, he's framing circumstances ahead of us so that those circumstances and experiences will have an effect upon our hearts that will bring us closer to Him. And that's how it works together for good. Um, affliction is and hardship and pain, it's, it's part of the Christian way, but it, like I say, it, it, it builds relationship, it builds Christian character, it builds your um, fullness in your relationship with God and with Jesus Christ. But now, uh, I'm going to stay in Psalm Psalm 77. I didn't really plan to, but I want to read this. So, uh, here's the... I'll I'll, I'll reference this scripture that Christopher pointed out, but there's something else there too. Uh, I'll read it, but then I'll read it in context with with the psalm. But David said, I am so troubled, I cannot speak. But there's another scripture where, uh, and I had it and I just lost it and I'll think of it again. <laughs> it was, uh, let's see, what was that now? Um, oh, that's what it was, yeah. It talks about when David was overwhelmed with grief. He said, my soul refused to be comforted. Yeah, and I brought that up the last last time I taught a message specifically on comfort, which was, was a while back. But I, I used that scripture. Because there is a condition of grief that is so overwhelming that maybe for a period the soul refuses to be comforted. It's not able to accept the consolation. And uh, so I was just saying that's not a condition we want to stay in for a long period of time. But nevertheless, uh, if we are find ourselves in that 
condition, I guess we're in good company because <laughs> David felt like that. <laughs> my sore, that's what I said, my sore ran in the night. Oh, it's right here. It's right in the very same chapter. Okay. Well, let's read it. Anyway, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and He gave ear unto me. I think this is important, and I know that God, uh, you hear people say things like, well, you know, God looks upon my heart and He sees the cry of my heart. There are certain seasons where um, we have to... Uh, follow through to a particular point in time where the cry actually manifests. There's something about doing something in your flesh that gives an ultimate fulfillment to the scripture. Now I can have a cry in my heart and God knows the cry of my heart, but God is going to bring me to a place down the road eventually where that cry actually comes out of my heart and I actually cry unto the Lord with my voice, right? It must need to be that the scripture be fulfilled. It's like we've been talking about, I've been talking a lot about Christ dwelling in your hearts by faith, but Christ has to come out of your heart and manifest in your flesh. That's the whole um, goal of Christianity is for Christ to come forth into your flesh and so that you become a manifestation of the Word of God in the flesh by yielding to the Holy Ghost. So there's something where it has to be fulfilled in the flesh. You see what I mean? And everything with God is, is, is like that. So if you have a crying heart, that's one thing, but it, you should follow through somewhere. It should follow through that eventually you cry unto God with your voice. And usually it's at the end or the climax of a very great trial or test or tribulation. So anyway, notice the emphasis right in the first chapter. I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice. Yeah. And he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night. So obviously our trials are, are sore spots. And the sores, they sort of, you know, they run. It's a running issue. It's an issue of anguish, it's an issue of grief, it's an issue of bereavement, it's an issue of bitterness, and, the, and it runs, it runs. And it's calling and crying for comfort and for consolation. So it runs. It says, my soul ran in the night and ceased not, my soul refused to be comforted. Well, I'm just trying to convince you, if it's in the scriptures, and the scriptures are a description of Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ understands all of this stuff that goes on in our hearts. Okay, I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. The holdest is mine eyes waking. I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. I've considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart and my spirit made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be fav favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Does his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. Okay, so I don't pretend to know what everybody's sore and grief is here. But I'm saying his sore and grief here was so intense that it, it was a temptation to question God. And he, he began to ponder the possibilities. Has God cast off? Is he no more favorable? You know, is his mercy gone? Does his promise fail? Is his, has he forgotten to be gracious? He's not saying that he has, that he's not saying yet that God has done all these things, but the doubts are beginning to arise by reason of the pain and the grief that he's in. But he says, ah, and I said, this is my infirmity. This is my weakness in believing in God. And, and that's the way we all get. We all get weak in our confidence towards God when our faith is tried. But, and, and so he had a temptation to question God. Is his, you know, is, is, is he failed? Is his promise fail? Is his mercy gone? Whatever. But he, in the end, his conclusion was, no, this is my infirmity. This is a weakness of faith that I have here. And so he says, uh, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand 
of the Most High. And the right hand of God is the right, His right hand of power, His right hand of mercy, grace, forgiveness, strength, consolation, everything that comes from the right hand of God. Where is Jesus set? On the right hand of God. And where the Holy Ghost is poured out through Jesus Christ, through His right hand. All the attributes of God's right hand are the positive things, the strengthening things, the consoling things, the comforting things, the forgiving things, the power of God. Is there a power in God to forgive? Is there power in God to heal physical ailments, mental, you want to call them mental infirmities? Is there power of God to uh, comfort the bereaved? Is there power of God to uh, give confidence to the doubting teacher who came here tonight and thought he had nothing to say? <laughs> okay, so there you go. So, But it requires faith. I, I had to stand up and start something. I had to reach out. I had to instigate something in faith for God to respond. Now, this is not, I, have, I have a few notes here. This, this is not, no part of it. But if you will reach out and begin a motion towards God, even if it's not the perfect motion, God will steer, steer it into, and he'll, he'll make the crooked path straight. And this is what I mean. If we're tried, if we're bereaved, if we're embittered, if we are got a sword running in the night, call unto God. You know, cry to God with your voice. Reach out. Open your heart. Reach out to God. Jesus Christ. You know, make a step. Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. He gave you a measure of faith, but our faith has to work. It has to take, take a step. That's what it means. Rise up and walk. Uh, feel after God. Well, I don't know what God wants me to pray and I don't know how He wants me to cry. I don't know what... But I will step out. I will say something to God. I'll begin talking. I don't know what God wants me to teach. I'll just, I'll just open the Bible, start reading the Scripture, and see what comes into my mind. Hopefully God will be faithful. Now, I'm not sure that, you know, if, if, if I'm sort of down on myself, if I struggle with uh, self-condemnation or anything, I may not believe God will help me for my sake. But one thing I, I will, will concede is if I stand up here, I believe God will inspire me and help me out for your sake. At least he'll do that. That much I believe. Right? Because David, as like David, uh, King David said about God's people, he, he said, Surely God, my goodness doesn't extend just to thee, but to the saints that are in the, in the earth, to the excellent saints in whom is all your delight. You're the saints of God. God delights in you. He delights. He has a delight in his, in his saints, even through... Whatever you go through, even through faults and failures and everything, God has a delight in His people. Fear not, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I'm talking about, this is the time of, 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 of pain and, and all of that. This is the time you want to look to your personal, very personal, intimate um, visitation from God. That's, you you want to... You want to anticipate that. Because that's when he, he's going to do it. And that's when it's easiest for him to do it. Because your heart is in, in need. It's very personal. Uh, yeah, the Father knows you by name. For the Father himself. The Father himself loves you. Because you believe I came out from God. Jesus, if you believe Jesus came out from God. Yeah. That he was the son of God. For the Father himself loves you. You know, this is a very personal thing. Amen. They'll no more say everybody to his brother, know the Lord. They'll all know me from the least to the greatest. And they shall all be taught of God. That's what, that's what uh, sonship and maturity and perfection is all about. That you know God for yourself. And he talks with you. You know how the song, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. I come to the garden alone. Now, we don't want to stay alone as in separated from the body of Christ or Christian fellowship, right? We don't want to forsake assembly. But I'm saying there's an exercise that you have with the Lord that's yours, your, your, your prayer closet, your intimate time with Him. So that is where you cultivate strength and get strength and root in self from God. Anyway, I'm starting to ramble. Let's get back to Psalm 77. I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. 
You know, I'll remember his acts of mercy and grace and forgiveness and comfort, the things he showed me in the past. Hey, we, we don't think or speculate or hope that all things work together for good. We, we know. know. We know. That's, I'm trying to emphasize that. We know. We know. If nothing else, I'm, you better walk away here with a pure, full confidence. Okay? God wants to comfort you. God wants to strengthen you. God wants to give you consolation. God wants to visit you. God wants to convince you he knows personally exactly what you're going through. And he can empower you and strengthen you as bad as it is to bring you through. And you will be better for it. You'll be closer to God when it's all over. I, okay. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of all, of all thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. The waters saw thee, O God, the waters saw thee, and they were afraid. The depths also were trouble, troubled. The clouds poured out water, the skies sent out a sound, thine arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven, the lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook, thy way is in the sea, and thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Thou lettest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. All right, that's Psalm 77. But I always like the idea of crying unto God with my voice. So, back to Isaiah 53, a man acquainted with grief, a man of sorrows. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. Uh, my soul refused to be comforted. You see the correlation there? We hid, we hid our face from him. My soul refused to be comforted. Sort of so, so withdrawn, so overwhelmed that... The heart was not open. You know, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and all of that stuff. So, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. There it is. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And there's another scripture. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you, that where I am, there ye may be also. There is comfort and consolation in the midst of all the severity and intensity and fear and the, uh, you know, all the warning and reproof and rebuke and the, just the intensity of God coming. Jesus is coming the second time and flaming fire taking vengeance and we all have to appear before judgment and you know all this stuff is uh, it's very um, very intense but there is a comfort and a consolation if you will embrace that then you'll get the comfort and the consolation the early church in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied you know as, as a father piteous his children. So doth the Lord pity them that fear him. So you have to have that element of fear. But they're working together. Fear and comfort. Fear and comfort. You tremble at the awesomeness of God, at uh, you know the description of the seriousness of things, the, at the destruction of the world, and, and all of that kind of thing. It's, it's an awesome thing. It's a fearful thing. It, it can make you tremble. But then the consolation is if you embrace that as truth, then God will pity, God will give comfort, God will give consolation. And it's like the two need to be there. Both elements need to be there. You can't have one, you can't have just fear, you can't have just you know, lightness of consolation without some kind of balance of, of fear working with it. It keeps everything in balance. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He has brought us a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. There's a characteristic of, of the Lord. I think Peter, I don't know if I'll go to the scripture or not, but Peter it said, uh, Jesus Christ, who did no sin, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. But he committed the keeping of his soul unto God as, a, uh, as unto a faithful creator. And this is our temptation as, as we 
here who have come out of a, a toxic spiritual environment and are having issues spoken against us and everything else, and I will add falsely, exaggerations and slanders and so on and so forth. Our job, our exercise is not to react to it. Just hold your peace, just hold your peace, and let the Lord fight your battles. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Remember Job? And all this, Job sinned not with his lips. Mm. And that's the thing. Distasteful, disagreeable experiences. And, and the, sad to say it, I've uttered some blasphemous things against God in my day. Uh, out of frustration and vexation and bitterness and this and that. Uh, all manner of sin and blasphemy, blasphemy whithersoever men blaspheme, shall be forgiven men. So you can speak a word against the uh, Son, Jesus, against the Son. You can speak a word against the Father. But you can't speak a word against the Holy Ghost. So I always wonder, what's that distinction? Well, you know, I've said things like, what's the matter with you, God? I thought if such and such and such and such would happen, such and such would happen. What's going on, God? Yeah. And that's how I talk. And then, you know, I think, well, I'm not saying... Uh, I'm, I'm speaking to God as this great spiritual entity God, or Father, if you will. But the Holy Ghost is different, because the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God that's been put right in your heart, who's giving you personal revelation, personal conviction, personal administration, personal comfort, personal witness of the truth. And the Holy Ghost is also operating through men of God and preachers, and I'm preaching now, I'm preaching by the Holy Ghost. Hope I am. No, I am. I'm preaching by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God that allows a very tangible manifestation of the character of God and the, and the revelation of God Right before you, tangible, something you see, something you hear. Now, God is an eternal spirit. You, you can't see or touch or hear Him. Like the Bible says, no man has seen God. No man has seen God, that you know, all-powerful entity God. No man has seen God at any time. The only way you can know about God is through and by Jesus Christ. So the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God that we receive through Jesus Christ, which is different than considering God as just some entity out there. Some spiritual entity. Yeah, so I can look at the spiritual entity and not understand why things are going so sour for me when I thought the Bible said this and I thought the Bible said that and how come I did this and the Bible said I should reap that. Well, obviously, either there's something I don't understand about my expectations of God or I haven't waited long enough. <laughs> right? One or the other. Because there's no unrighteousness in God. There's no iniquity in God. I can't really charge God. But ashamedly, at times, I feel like I have. Okay, so, I can, but I can blaspheme God and be forgiven. But I can't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. I can blaspheme the Son and be forgiven. But not the Holy Ghost. There's a difference there. Um, I don't even know what got me onto that. Anyway, we as Christians ought to be, I know everybody that listens to, all, all of us here, we, we, we just talk about this so much. Embracing the sufferings of Christ and all of that. What is God looking for in us? Is He looking for... Uh, I mean, there's something... There's a, there's a condition of heart that God is looking for in us. And I already touched on it. It's that brokenness, that contrition. And, well, I'm going to say this too. Uh, there's a... There's that movie from Mel Gibson called The Passion of the Christ. Does everybody remember that? It was a very popular movie. Mel Gibson made it. And it really tried to, he tried to uh, sensationalize the physical sufferings of Christ. Now, I never saw the movie. I saw a few excerpts of it here and there. And uh, 
Now, I personally reject that. That movie is not of God. And, and I've made my case for that in the book of Acts when Paul was on Mars Hill and he saw a uh, inscription to the unknown God and he said, well, you, you're, you're making an inscription to the unknown God. He says, to the unknown God, I'm going to declare to you who this unknown God is. Yeah. And he preached Jesus Christ. You, your God can't be unknown. You have to identify him. You have to know who he is. It's of no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. It can't be some ambiguous higher power in the uh, all ulterior universe or whatever it has it has to be jesus christ the, the son of god that you know that lives and dwells in your heart and walks with you and talks with you that's that's what salvation is to know the lord to know the only true god jesus uh god and jesus christ whom he sent so and then paul goes on and he said you ought not to think that the godhead the power of god can be represented by art or craft or man's device so that's what I'm saying. You cannot represent the power of God through the imagination of a man who makes a movie which is man's device. And the real focus and the fundamental, the only fundamental way that God manifests His image is through the flesh. Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. And so if Christ is in me, and if Christ is operating in me, then you're seeing a certain portion of God's character or whatever manifested in the flesh and likewise in you. If Christ is, dwells in you and you yield to Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, then Christ is manifested in your flesh. Um, Thou shalt not make any graven image or any likeness of anything in heaven above or on the earth or beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them. God does not want the... Uh, image and character of Christ portrayed particularly by people who are in Hollywood who are not particularly Christians because they're going to portray it with a uh, they're going to skew the represent, representation of his image according to their own imagination and it's going to not be their Im image is Christ it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall short now here's, here's my point about the passion of the Christ was that by and large a lot of people were were made to be moved by the physical sufferings of Christ. And I don't emphasize that. I mean, I, sure, he did suffer physically, and, and there is a point to the fact that he did suffer physically, but is that what pleased God? And I'm going back to Isaiah here. That's not what ultimately pleased God about Jesus. Yes, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He struggled. He rustled in the flesh. He knew what God wanted him to do, to go through all that suffering, and he had a re, an aversion to it. We talked about this. Brother Stair has talked about it lots of times. Lots of preachers talk about this. He rustled. He wanted to get out of it. If this cup might pass, Father, is there another way? But once he rustled with it, and once he resigned himself to go forward and go into this cup of sufferings, once he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, he resigned himself to that cup then the angels came and strengthened him, and, and he, he walked into it with no reservations. It was just sort of, come on, let us go forth. He that betrays me is, is at hand. Let's go. Okay, so he suffered in the flesh. Sure he did. But listen to the scripture. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. How about us? It pleases the Lord to bruise him. Is he some kind of masochist? He likes to see us have pain and, and, and get a chuckle on it while he's on his throne? No. It pleases the Lord to bruise us and bring us through these things so that he, our hearts become soft, tender, meek, full of humility, full of neediness. Our hearts cry unto God. Then that is just the sweetest incense, the sweetest thing God could ever hope for. Look, there's someone who's crying out to me, knows that they actually need me, and now their heart is open. I can come in. I can sup with them. I can have fellowship with them. I can show them my glory. I can give them consolation and comfort. And we do all things. Work together for good. How about the passion? And, you know, Mel Gibson calls it the passion of the Christ, right? Well, what was the passion? You know, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. There's a great passion with Jesus that he wanted to eat the Passover with his disciples. Now, we, we've taught in uh, 
that the symbolic representation of Passover, Christ is our Passover, Christ was what crucified, sacrificed for us. He is our Passover. The Passover that we eat with Jesus is the fellowship with the sufferings, the fellowship with the state of being in pain and agony and travail. All right, now, all that leading up to this. So please the Lord to bruise him, not because he's a masochist, but because it's a necessary thing to culture our hearts into a softness, a tenderness, a neediness, and something that he's setting up for a, a great, glorious communion with his spirit. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. See that? When Jesus was on the cross, Isaiah said, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Didn't emphasize the flesh so much. But when God shall see his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now I'm going to say the next scripture mockingly to make the point, okay? He shall see all the, uh, all the whippings on his back and his uh, flesh tore up like hamburger and shall be satisfied. Is that what it says? No. You know, he'll see the nails going through his hand and he'll be satisfied. No, nope, that's not what satisfied him. Now those are sufferings and they are necessary and they're all leading up to something else. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. So what's God looking for us in the state of our hearts to be satisfied with us? What's he looking for? He's looking for travail of soul. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors when he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And so that's another thing we can take comfort in is that regardless of our state, Jesus Christ ever liveth to make intercession for our souls according to the will of God. So even if I'm so overwhelmed, I can't speak. I, at least I can have the thought and the acknowledgement that Jesus, as a high priest, he's making intercession for me concerning that state that I'm, I'm in. And he will bring me to another state where I'm able to receive consolation and comfort. Isaiah 54, verse 11, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted. Here's another condition where we just seem to be tossed through the experiences and traumas of life. Very difficult for us to be comforted. God says to those in that, that condition, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires. I will make thy windows of agates, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones. All thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shalt thou be established, thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. See, God creates the smith that fans the fire of affliction in your life. God does that. Now, God is, this is where we remember God is all-powerful, sovereign, all-knowing. He's in total control of every single thing that happens. Remember, all the hairs of your head are numbered. Every one of them. Every in, individual in the body of Christ is known of God by name. God holds every little molecule and electron in their position and orbit and however that all that stuff works on the subatomic level. Who holds all that together? The scientists are scratching their brains every day wondering how it all holds together. But I have a simple answer. Yeah, by Jesus Christ, all things consist or have their consistency, right? So this, uh, this pulpit here is just a bunch of uh, 
if, if we break down this pulpit to its fundamental <laughs> building blocks and all it is is a bunch of protons and neutrons and electrons flying around each other and held together by mysterious magnetic forces or what have you, well, if the electrons are flying around, how come the electrons just don't fly around in random? Yeah. You know, how come the, how come the uh, atomic structures aren't just flying every which way? What, what, what holds all the atoms together so that this has is consistently a pulpit, or you are consistently in, in a body that doesn't change? What, what, what brings that consistency, the force that holds it all together consistently? That's the Word of God. That's Jesus Christ. By Him all things consist. I always found it interesting that they said, oh, we found the Higgs boson particle, and they call it the, they call it the God particle. They didn't know what to call it, so they said, they call it the God particle. So in one sense, it's, it's kind of interesting that they're finally down at that level, they're beginning to acknowledge God. But the, the thing is, is God is not a particle. God is a spirit. But it's like the Bible says in Jeremiah, I think it is, if the foundations of the earth could be discovered, God said, then will I cut off Israel for being a nation for all that they have done. And that scripture is a promise of God. That's God reassuring his people in spite of everything that they had done wrong that he will not utterly forsake them because they're his people. So if the foundations of the earth could be discovered, which means it can't be, they'll always find some smaller thing or some smaller thing or some smaller thing. Now they're into the quantum physics stuff, quantum physics, where their little, uh, what do they call it? I don't even know what they call it. Anyway. Plank level. Plank level, where the, you get a particle that can be in two places at the same time. And they, it defies the conventional laws of physics. And so they say, well, they're starting to theorize now there must be multiple parallel universes. This is the crazy thinking they're going through. Because they, can't, they won't acknowledge God. They can't explain it. So they come up with all these wild theories. Like, and, and the implication of it is, you know, if I'm walking down the street and if I decide to, to take a step to the left then that step to the left will trigger an entire universe of ramifications. But if I take a step to the right, that step to the right will trigger a different set of ramifications in another parallel universe. So all the possibilities of things that I could say, do, or act, each triggers another universe of possibilities. Well, that's preposterous. You know, the only thing they're seeing there is they are seeing the eternal Godhead. They're seeing his eternal power. Because all that stuff is just saying eternity. But they won't call it God. Right. But anyway. That's man starting to delve into the spiritual realm. That's, that's another reason you know that we don't have much time left. Right? We don't have much time left. As soon as man starts intruding into the spiritual realm, God will put a stop to it. Yeah. If God just lets man go, he says, wow, if I just let him go, he's going to eat of the tree of life and live forever. And you say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, you don't want man to eat of the tree of life and live forever in his fallen state. Mm. That would be disastrous. God won't let that happen. Anyway, that's another aside. Uh, let's look at... One or two more scriptures here. Uh, something I was looking for in particular. So where does the comfort of God become magnified and healing comes for the soul? There is a bomb in Gilead. There is healing for the souls of God's people when, you know, when they're in that meekness and they're in that state of need and they're looking to God for help. and All that's available to us. Behold, I have created... This is where I was. Yeah, I, uh, in another place in Isaiah, the Bible says, I form light and create the darkness. I make peace and I make evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. God sits upon his throne and he looks down upon the children of men. He fashions all of their hearts alike. Whether we're saved or we're not saved, whether we acknowledge it's happening or whether we don't acknowledge it's happening, God is in control. He is fashioning the heart of the righteous. And he is fashioning the heart of the wicked. He is allowing their hearts to take a certain form. And he's influencing that motion and that, that fashioning, that formation. <coughs> what if God, willing to show wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction? So 
that that scripture is saying, yeah, if God wants to take a man and fashion him in, into an evil form, you say, well, the poor guy, doesn't he have a choice? You know, is God unfair? No. What if God already endured with much long suffering these vessels of wrath? And now, God, by his own um, supernatural and righteous judgment, sees that, okay, there's a heart that's, that is set on evil. It loves darkness more than light. It will never, ever receive, you know, a call to salvation. It, it, it's not redeemable anymore. It may have been at one time, but now it's no longer. God suffered for a long, long time. Okay, well, I'm going to do with that evil vessel what I want. I'm going to make it do my, fulfill my purpose. So I'll fashion it into evil the way I want it to be evil. Because it's going to be evil anyway. Well, God reserves the right to do that. You know, because they did not receive the love of the truth, God sent them a strong delusion so they could believe a lie. You know, God does all that stuff. And it's not unrighteous with God. But, you know, but anyway. So what I'm saying is God is sovereign. That, that's, I'm trying to... Uh, strengthen and illustrate the sovereignty of God, that God, if He does all that, then, then He's also doing the same for us, only on our behalf, mm -hmm. so that all things work together for good. Right? Because that's how much power He has. Blessed is the man who now chooses and causes to approach. God is causing you to approach. And that's how all the pain and all of that stuff works together for good, because it causes you to approach. Uh, approach to God. And that's the only way it is because as the scripture says is there any that seek after God? No. There's none that seek after God. None? Nobody. Not a single one. No. Not one. Not even one seeks after God. And what that means is that if you were left of yourself and God decided to withhold any and all influence upon you in your life, never do anything you would never come to know God. He has to cause it to happen. Yeah. And he's not going to, uh, you know, for, he's going to do it by framing external circumstances and things that affect your heart until you, of your own heart, reach out to God. It's very important to God not to force the issue. Did you know that? Because God's after worship. David talked about, you know, my free will offering. He, he, let, he, he allows it. He doesn't not forcing the issue, but He allows all that to bring your heart to a place. Your heart cries out to Him without a direct coercion from God. That's why it's very important not to force these issues. So, I have created the smith that blows the coals in the fire. And that's, that's what we say uh, again. Sanctify the Lord of hosts Himself. Let Him be your fear and let Him be your dread. When... When things happen that are not agreeable and that are grievous in our lives and when our faith is tried, and it's, it's a challenge, I know it's difficult, but sanctify God in it. Say, okay, God has framed this. God has allowed this to happen. You sanctify God in it. You, you, and you consider God as being the source and overall cause of either doing it or allowing it or letting it. And that there's a particular reason God wants it to go like this, even though it's disagreeable to me. It's painful to me. And if you sanctify the Lord Himself, then you then you are you you get a mind, a spirit of mind. Then you're you're um, you make inquiry. So you did this, God. Why? Why did this happen? Right? And in, inclines your inquiry to God. That's the. What God wants. He wants a heart that has been inclined to look to Him. And it's just like Job. I mean, Satan was the one who afflicted Job, but Job never said Satan afflicted me. You know, Job always reckoned it was God. His complaint wasn't to Satan. His complaint was to God. Right? Our complaint is not to any individual or any Christian or any minister or anything like that. You know, if we make inquiry... What are you doing, God? There's something God is doing. And we need patience. We need patience. Patience. Strength to endure hardships, pain, agony. Strength to endure through that until we get to the other side of the experience. And then there's great joy that awaits us there. That's why we need to have fervent charity amongst ourselves. Keep yourselves in the love of God. You need to keep yourselves in the constant, full, fully persuaded awareness that God loves you and see to it that you love God 
by looking to him, by fellowshipping with the saints, by this exercise that we have of sharing and communicating together. And it will cover. It'll, it'll be strengths. It'll get us through. And we'll all be better for it. And we'll be preparing to meet God, because that's what this thing is about. It's nothing about what you accomplish in life. It's not about the pride of life. It's not about how big a ministry you got, how many people in your crusade, how many stations, you, uh, radio stations you're on. It's nothing to do with that. It's to prepare to meet God. That's what we're here for. And that, if it doesn't follow through to that, then we're missing it somehow. That's the only thing we should be concerned about. That we have to make sure that our hearts have been prepared to meet our God. We are in the end of the age. So, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. I have created the waster to destroy. So that's the devil. God created the devil to destroy. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servant of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. So wherefore, laying aside all malice, which is like bitterness or ill, Ill feelings, thus we have to be on guard against ill feelings, because we have plenty of reasons to feel justified in feeling bad or ill, especially if offenses are committed against us or we don't understand our circumstances, you know, whatever. Laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. You also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Do you know when your heart's in anguish and you cry out to God sincerely from the bottom of your heart, I cry unto the Lord with my voice? Do you know that's an acceptable spiritual sacrifice? The Lord hears it. Out of his holy hill. Out of his, and heaven will shake and he'll come down with his spirit on the wings of a cherub. And all of that. And he sees that anguish travail. Okay, wherefore also it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. See, you won't be confounded by it all, because it will all work together for good. And you will know how it works together for good. Unto you therefore which believe he's precious, unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders is disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul, having your conversation, or that means your lifestyle, having your lifestyle honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil, they speak against you as, as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. See, we need to keep on living good. Holy, righteous, honestly in our conversation, our lifestyles. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, but what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults you shall take it patiently? But... If, when you do well and suffer for it, and you take it patiently, this is acceptable unto God. For even hereunto were you uh, called, because also Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. <coughs> who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled, reviled not again. Now, I'm going to say something here. I saw a little <coughs> uh, stick it. Post, uh, post it, stick it, note posted on my brother's refrigerator. 
and a kind of it's a kind of a, in a way a little bit of a humorous uh, worldly kind of parable if you will or proverb and it but it does illustrate this thing this issue who one who is reviled reviled not again if a man is just beating the air with a bunch of senseless insults and mocking the pronunciation of your name but there's no substance behind what he's saying and he's just sort of beating the air and, and attacking you he's reviling you the Bible says don't don't revile just hold hold your peace right well my brother's uh, fridge has a saying on it it says don't argue with a stupid antagonistic person first they're gonna bring you down to their level then they're gonna beat you by experience See, this makes the point, right? And the, but, but a better way to say it, biblically that is, I mean that's a good way to say it, but a better way to say it biblically is, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like him. So somewhere in all of this, you know, someone that needs just to be quiet, hold your peace, Lord fight your battles. That's why I say every mouth that rises up, if, if I'm a teacher... If I be a teacher, I say if for the sake of others out there. If I be a teacher of God. If I be being moved by the Holy Ghost and what I preach and say. Right? If, if, if that be the case. And I am slandered or, or reviled. Or somebody rises up against me in judgment falsely. Somewhere, something that I'm going to say is going to condemn them. I don't have to even deliberate it. I don't have to try and do it. All I have to do is just get up here and teach and perform the role of my calling, somewhere the Spirit of God is going to condemn their false accusation. Because it's the Word of God. Every mouth that rises up against the judgment, thou shalt condemn. That's how to tell if your righteousness is of God or not. Well, we'll see. Time will tell, right? Time will tell. But anyway, there it is. You know, as a sheep before her shearers. Yeah. You ever have people just shear you? I mean, say so much evil against you that you can tell by how they're talking. They don't believe there's one stitch of integrity in you towards God. Not one stitch. You're completely written off in their sight. Well, they're just shearing you. Okay. But God, Jesus committed himself to God that judges righteously. We are talking about that earlier, earlier today when we were discussing, right? God knows how to judge i mean we we in our wildest imaginations couldn't dream up the appropriate righteous properly balanced measure of judgment for someone who says something against us we don't know the depths of their hearts and we don't know the fullness of god's overall plan and purpose just commit it to god god judges righteously and then in our patience our ability to wait on god we will possess our souls our souls we will possess them we, we, we will be in possession, in control of our own spirit. A man will be able to bear rule over his own spirit. Bitterness and malice won't get the best of you because you will, you will be the possessor of your soul, not Satan, not bitterness, not maliciousness. And the, what helps us do that is to receive the consolation, to the comfort, the consolation that God has provided for us. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were as sheep going astray, but now you are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And I feel like maybe that's a good place to stop. So I will stop. <laughs> All things work together for, for good. Hopefully it's in, in a way that we've been renewed in the spirit of our minds. It's, it's right in front of us now. That's, oh yes, we know. This is how it works. From what's before yeah, our eyes. right. And Great. this is how it works. So expect the comfort and consolation of the Holy Ghost. Because He He promised it. Amen. And reach out by faith. It's available. God has provided all things for us. Like that. All right. God bless y'all.